the messy truth about men and women in the 21st century. That's one title there. Uh, the Hunger of the Wolf. He's written opinion pieces and essays for The New Yorker, The New York Times, The Atlantic, The uh, Esquire, The Walrus, and many, many other publications. And he is the host of the hit audio series, How Not to F Up Your Kids Too Bad, and its sequel, How Not to F Up Your Marriage Too Bad, on uh, Audible. So, uh, Stephen, a great pleasure to have you with us. Stephen's recently uh, written a uh, very important piece for the Atlantic uh, on uh, Chad GPT, and today he'll be uh, talking with us on what not to talk about when we talk about AI or what not to think about when we think about AI. Uh, so, Stephen, thank you so much. I will spotlight you, and the um, stage is yours. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, so great. I'm just going to talk today about some of my most recent thinking uh, about ChatGPT in particular, but more uh, natural language processing and AI systems. Um, I began working with them in about 2017. Um, and I've sort of been fortunate to have access to sort of earlier versions than the ones that become quite popular and worked with them, worked with them creatively, uh, worked with them to write about them uh, for um, for for uh, since basically about 2019, which in this space, of course, is like basically a millennium. Um, you know, as AI systems become more integrated into our lives, they will alter the foundations of society. Uh, they will change the way we work, the way we communicate, and the way we relate to one another. They will challenge our assumptions about what it means to be human, and will force us to confront difficult questions about the nature of consciousness the limits of knowledge and the role of technology in our lives. So everything that I have said so far um, was written half by myself and half by ChatGPT. Um, you know, perhaps you could figure out which half is which if you parsed it closely uh, or if you used an algorithmic test for to spot algorithmic language, but how sure could you be even now when you think of what I've just said? Do you have the time or energy to figure out what I said and what a machine generated for me. And in the end, how clear can you or anyone else be? So I think the way that I think about this moment where the human and mechanical languages fuse or become uh, indistinguishable from another is as the big blur. And the big blur is a period of profound confusion. And it's a practical question as much as a philosophical one. And I, I think the question is how to think through this blurring of human and artificial language. And I'd like to begin with a quote from Marshall McLuhan, because, you know, I, the farther I go into this stuff, the, the interesting thing I find about McLuhan is that the crazier his pronouncements were in the 50s and 60s, the more accurate they turn out to be now. Um, this, is a, and you know, some of the more banal stuff he wrote just doesn't turn out to matter at all, but the stuff that seems like lunatic prophecy actually turns out to be quite valid and quite valuable. Um, so this is a passage from the Gutenberg Galaxy, where he described the Renaissance as an interface that emerged after the birth of print. Um, this is not GPT, this is, uh, this is McLuhan. An age in rapid transition is one which exists on the frontier between two cultures and between conflicting technologies. Every moment of its consciousness is an act of translation of each of these cultures into the other. Today, we live on the frontier between five centuries of mechanism and the new electronics, between the homogenous and the simultaneous. It is painful, but fruitful. The 16th century Renaissance was an age on the frontier between 2000 years of alphabetic and manuscript culture on the one hand, and the new mechanism of repeatability and quantification on the other. You know, of course, it's it's a terrible cliche to compare any given technological development to the birth of print. and um, you know, mostly such comparisons are quite overblown and imprecise at best. But I think one thing we can take from McLuhan's comparison is this notion of the interface. I find this very useful. Um, you know, for McLuhan, the Renaissance was not a moment in time or a period or a revolution in thinking. You know, it was not a disruption. It was an exchange between two different epochs. And that exchange was quite subtle and profound. You know, one example he provides is that the regulation of print you know, the precision and replicability, which distinguished typeset texts from scribal manuscripts, was an aesthetic framework. Uh, and it had provided an approach to knowledge, a, a regulated approach to knowledge, 
that actually gave rise to the scientific method. Like when you have really regulated texts, you want your knowledge to be as regulated as the texts you're you're giving them, you're 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 writing in, right? And on the other hand, you know, some of the, the most subtle and profound consequences of the transition uh, took centuries to reveal themselves. So, you know, McLuhan points out that the idea of a printed narrative containing a personal voice in a, in a continuous story, uh, you know, what we think of as pretty much the defining feature of a printed text, you know, did not arrive until two centuries after the printing press. So this interface we are in right now uh, around language between human and mechanical language uh, is at once very profound and very difficult to predict. And as we're in the middle of, you know, one such interface, like we should be humble, you know, and wary because there's a lot that we just can't see. And there's a lot that won't reveal itself until much later. So now at the time of writing, um, the general public really has access to only large language models with 175 billion parameters. So about the size of GPT-3. Um, natural language processing and you know, AI generally has sort of lurched into the public consciousness by stagger steps. So first there was, you know, you know, first there was GPT-3, which I wrote about, but nobody cared about. Um, then there was DALI-2, then Stable Diffusion, then Midjourney, then Chat GPT, which caused everyone to freak out. And each new arrival is sort of unthinkingly filtered through a series of traditional, mostly vacuous hopes and anxieties. And at this early stage, those hopes and anxieties have concentrated with, you know, on two foci, like two principal ways of expression. One is the hope and fear of artificial personhood. And the other is the hope and fear of the degradation of creativity or the mechanization of creativity. And I think by addressing what I'd like to do today is look into why these are the wrong things to think about and why think and why, and because they're so common, right? They are absolutely the most likely things you are to read in the New York Times or even the Atlantic or the New Yorker are exactly these kinds of anxieties and hopes. And they are really misplaced and they're kind of disguising the real transition that we're in uh, to me. So science and science fiction were both deceptive about the moment of crisis, it turns out. We were, we were very bad at predicting the long, what the long for arrival of mechanical language would look like. Um, it turns out to be utterly different from the fantasies that once obsessed the world. Um, the most obvious case is the Turing test, which has turned out to be mainly a red herring. Uh, you know, one session with ChatGPT is enough to dispel the idea that a machine can write, that can write meaningfully, is an artificial person. You know, nobody except extremely lonely engineers worry, worry about whether it's wrong to turn a large language model off. Um, but literature and the movies always understood the arrival of mechanical meaning as the birth of artificial personhood. And it's an old story with remarkable consistency. Uh, you know, there's a very little difference between really like 16th century, 16th, 17th century concepts of the golem, uh, manufactured people in Frankenstein and in her, you know, somehow electricity flowing through a physical form creates a person. And, you know, contemporary authors like Katsuo Chiguro in Claire in the Sun and Ian McEwen in Machines Like Me still pedal this antique line, basically. And uh, the fantasies are, I mean, even now, even when you can actually go and use an artificial intelligence, they're still clinging to these really old fantasies that are really revealing more of the fantasists than of anything. Um, you know, it's very simple to see why we have this hunger. Uh, it, it's brought up in cybernetics too. It's that it would make us like a god you know, the God who made the universe with a word, you know, God who created people so he would have someone to recognize him. And the narcissism and the thirst of that fantasy are so palpable, uh, you know, to make us like God, but God at his most vulnerable, you know, God who needs something from creation, who creates the universe, but then dotes over a foible, unreliable mirror. Um, it seems somehow at this point necessary to repeat what is obvious from any single use of a large language model, I would say. That the dream of an artificial consciousness is a non-starter, that no linguistic machine is any closer, not one half step closer to artificial consciousness than a pocket calculator. Um, the advancement of transformer-based artificial intelligence is not an advancement towards artificial personhood for a very simple reason. And I think it's really important to keep this reason absolutely in mind, um, which is that there is no falsifiable thesis of consciousness. And you cannot 
mine for gold if you don't know what gold is. Um, the limitations of the tech itself, you know, preclude the long for arrival of a manufactured soul, at least on the terms of the, the, of the fantasies, right? Because natural language processing is a statistical pattern matching operation, fundamentally, a series of instructions incapable of intention. And that means, you know, it can only ever be the expressed intention of another. It cannot be its own intention, which is one of the definitions, I would say the most powerful definition of what it means to be a person, what it means to be a valid individual. So the problem is that there are no well-established theories of consciousness that are falsifiable. Christoph Koch, who's a, a leading neuroscientist, put the question of machine consciousness this way in a recent article for Scientific American. Ultimately, what we need is a satisfying scientific theory of consciousness that predicts under which conditions any particular physical system, whether it is a complex circuit of neurons or silicon transistors, has experiences. Furthermore, why does the quality of these experiences differ? Why does a clear blue sky feel so different from the screech of a badly tuned violin? Do these differences in sensation have a function? And if so, what is it? Such a theory will allow us to infer which systems will experience anything. Absent a theory with testable predictions, any speculation about machine consciousness is based solely on our intuition, which the history of science has shown is not a reliable guide. That's a little classic bit of understatement at the end. But his point is that consciousness remains in the realm of metaphor, uh, you know, which is where we go when facts elude us. This effort will take decades, given the Byzantine complexity of the central nervous system, Koch concludes. So our current definition of consciousness is that it doesn't appear artificial, an entirely negative description. Um, to, get, to return to the question of intentionality, which I think is core, um, I think in the foundational text of Western humanism, Pico de la Mirandola's Oration on the Dignity of Man from 1486, what separates human beings is exactly their unfathomability, even from God, right? He imagines the creator speaking to the first person, quote, we have given you, O Adam, no visage proper to yourself, nor endowment properly your own, in order that whatever place, whatever form, whatever gifts you may with premeditation select, these same you may have and possess through your own judgment and decision. The nature of all other creatures is defined and restricted within laws which we have laid down. You, by contrast, impeded by no such restrictions, may by your own free will, to whose custody we have assigned you, trace for yourself the lineaments of your own nature. Mutability, in essence, is the human condition, and an algorithm is not mutable. Um, there is a hard limit here. The limit may only be in my own thinking, I fully confess, but I don't, I don't see how mutability can be converted into a series of instructions. I don't know what a machine that doesn't follow instructions means, much less what it looks like. And so if an artificial person arrives, it will not be because engineers have liberated algorithms from being instructions, but they, because they have figured out how human beings are nothing more than a series of instructions. And the nar narcissistic power trip of human gods making artificial people would then give way to an existential deflation. Uh, an artificial consciousness would be a demonstration that free will is illusory. Um, you know, in the meantime, the soul still remains uh, among us, you know, like a medieval lump in the throat. And I, I, I don't see us progressing anywhere in anything that I've seen from natural language processing, uh, including 540 billion parameters with uh, palm where it's capable of low level chain reasoning. Um, nothing that what I would see would distract me from what it is, which is a text prediction machine. Right. And the, the comparison that I made with a pocket calculator is actually one that I think is quite apt. Like what we're dealing with here is the pocket calculator of language and, uh, and, and it, of increasing powers. And what we have to adjust is our notion that whatever talks is human, which is one of the most profound assumptions that we make. Like if a cow suddenly started talking to us, we would assume that it was a person in a way that we would not because it can't. Um, so a related anxiety to, the, to the, the fear and hope of artificial consciousness is the anxiety about the degradation of art through artificial intelligence. And again, this is a very common thing that you read about in magazines, Nick Cave, you know, who I love and uh, you know, wrote a piece about GPT and using it to write a song and how degrading it was. And people are really afraid, you know, artists are really afraid of this. Um, certainly, there are already lawsuits against stable diffusion and so on. Um, you know, most people, if they're familiar with the use of creative artificial intelligence at all, 
uh, probably know it through one of the text to image AI applications. So DALI 2 from OpenAI is the best known, but Midjourney and Stability Diffusion are close followers. I'd say Stability Diffusion is probably better, much more interesting to use anyway. Um, and the, and the, if you haven't used them, the best way to sense their power is to see what they can do yourself. Uh, they The effects can be astonishing. And, and I sort of work with a few artists who are in this space and the prompt engineering on it is getting more and more sophisticated. And I think it is legitimate to say that it is a form of art now, uh, engineering prompts, um, which is essentially figuring out how to raid archives to create mashups of incredible complexity and depth and which are being used for things that I, I think have not been properly exposed, like very fascinating abstract art conceptions. Um, there was a recent piece in The Guardian about how it's being used by architects but it has a it has a lot of applications that have just barely been touched. Like just like I, I don't think they have been e even mildly addressed. Um, and we we still haven't had, you know, really really great stuff. Mostly this is mostly this is stuff so far that's done on your phone on your computer for your own benefit to show your friends. And really, it's much closer to something like Victorian collage or even like, uh, you know, various Japanese crafts that have widespread communities that share them, but, uh, you know, ultimately are about the practice of making them rather than the finished product and, and perhaps don't rise to the level of art. Um, I, I think that's, you know, what Hatsune Miku, who's a, a Japanese avatar that um, people use to write songs is actually a, a, a good example of a, sort of an art form that predated uh, AI art as it currently exists, where you have you know, kids from all the walks of life essentially using this character, this avatar, this virtual celebrity as a venue for their creativity. Uh, but uh, on the other hand, I don't think it would qualify necessarily as art, at least by, you know, stringent definitions of the, of high modernist values in the, in the sense that it's not made really to be an expression of uh, community or communion with some higher power, but or some ultimate expression, but a pleasure to make and a sort of community that makes it something on the. I mean, not to take away from craft, it's just I, it's just a different process. Uh, rather than making something that you then display to everyone, it's really something that you make in a community for like-minded people. Um, this is a long way to go. I think we the stuff people are relatively impressed by it but on the other hand it hasn't quite re reached the level uh that it will reach and it is getting there it is getting there and it's getting there quickly but i don't think we're in a place now where ai art has distinguished itself as the medium that it really is so that confused state the confusion of ar ai art in its pre-nascent state really because it hasn't quite been born yet um leads sort of sadly but inevitably to fear uh, when Jason Allen's Théâtre d'Opéra Spatial, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right because it's spelled incorrectly, but won first prize for digital art at the Colorado State Fair, the reaction was entirely predictable. So there were quick denunciations on Twitter. Of course, those follow basically every human activity, but uh, it was that, you know, Théâtre d'Opéra Spatial wasn't art at all. And also somehow that it was going to replace art. Art is dead, Allen himself told the New York Times. It's over. AI won. Humans lost. I mean, you're just pushing some buttons, right? Um, what is so tiresome about this particular argument and the fear of AI art is that it's all been said before uh, about photography and and after that about hip hop as well. You know, it took almost half a century before photography was recognized as legitimate art form. Baudelaire famously said that photography was the mortal enemy of art. And the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston, you know, which was, I think it was the first American institution to collect photographs at all, didn't start doing so until 1924. So the anxiety around photography was nearly identical to the fear around creative AI. A camera was an art, but it was also going to replace art. And the criticism was that it was a mere mechanism, as one critic put it in 1865. I mean, you're just pushing some buttons, right? And, you know, the idea that art is only art when it shows evidence of handicraft uh, is very old. I mean, it's so old that it almost feels ridiculous to oppose it at this point. I mean, people who say that anyone can make AI art are the latest in a long line of people who said the same thing about the most important art of the 20, 20th century. Anyone could make a Jackson Pollock drip painting. Anyone could make Andy Warhol's Brillo boxes. Anyone could make Barnett Newman's Voice of Fire. Um, when hip hop 
appeared on the scene, um, it was treated as just theft, right? Like they're not making melodies, they're not making rhythms, they're not music, they're not real music. Um, they're just stealing real music, putting beats on it, and then, but they didn't understand that in that recombination and that um, and that way of uh, processing history, hip hop was giving birth to you know the most interesting music of its period. Right. And I think to me, hip hop is actually a very good model for how to think about what AI art could be, because it requires total technical mastery and technological um, innovation, like which you definitely saw in the early days of hip hop in the 70s and 80s, where they invented the break and they invented, uh, you know, the turntables and the microphone and they and they figured out how to do it. And at the same time, it required a level of familiarity with popular music that was unprecedented. Right. Like it required a it required a familiarity with well, you had people, you know, from from the Bronx going to Jamaica, going to the islands to get rec specifically to get records that nobody else had so that they could bring them back and give the and give the breaks that nobody else could provide. And I think when you think of AI as that as in that sort of liminal space between curation and creation, between uh between you know, recombining, recombining things that are there, but doing so in a way that requires both a, you know, an enormous familiarity with history and literature, uh, as well as the vision to combine them in new ways that will bring pleasure. I think that that to me is the path forward uh, for this as as a medium, right? Like it is, it is, um, it is now like when when this becomes a medium that is widely known, it will it will not require somehow you don't you won't have to not need to know about literary style anymore quite the opposite i think i think when you use this stuff to you do create creative work which i've done in a few places you know i've wrote an ai generated story for lit hub i wrote a 17.1 percent computer generated story for la review of books and i've done similar things for wired and mit tech review um it requires absolute fastidious control over categories of style and you need to know what they are. You need to be able to tell the computer what to do. And you need to, so you have to, you have to understand the computational matrix, but you also have to understand the history of style. And you have to understand the history of form uh, in order to make it work. So, you know, I, I would just say that the idea that this is going to lead to massive declines in, you know, the teaching of literature or something like that, um, I, I don't believe it for a moment. I think it is going to require an immense consciousness of language that's going to, and, and, and um, as well as things like immense study of, of philosophy of mind, that, it, that it, it's actually going to be more urgent than ever before that those humanistic approaches are, are taken to this material. So with the hindsight of a hundred years, it's clear that the machines didn't replace art. Photography didn't replace art. Two turntables and a microphone didn't replace music. Um, Photography and conceptual art didn't end anything. Um, new and wonderful things came very slowly into existence. And I believe that artificial intelligence isn't going to replace creativity at all. It's going to simply reconfigure the nature of creativity. Um, I, I think also it's important to understand that this is very much the medium of this moment, right? Uh, creative AI is the most direct form of artistic reproduction, right? It is the art of big data. I mean, that is, it is the, it is art made by people for whom, you know, um, you know, what Leotard said in the postmodern condition is he said, data banks are the encyclopedias of tomorrow. They transcend the capacity of each of their users. They are nature for postmodern man. So this is the art of that nature. This is the art of where, where archives and data are the world that you live in. And they are, and they are, and they, and they are what you find and what you take to make into something beautiful. Um, it's the art of the archives. And it's, you know, that is already what we live in. You know, I mean, already when you look at, when you, when you think about the nature of originality and creativity at this moment, I mean, this, this year, 20, I think it was 2021, actually, was the first year where new music sales declined. Like they became sm a smaller portion of music that then was consumed because we're in a world where, you know, every kid who comes up literally has access to every piece of music that ever was, right? And when I think about my son, who's a, a film student, um, you know, he decided during COVID that he was going to watch every Japanese movie that he could think of. So that was, he, he and his buddies watched three Japanese movies a day for a month. They saw 90 Japanese movies. When I was a kid, that would have been inconceivable. 
that would have been like a, a lifetime's journey to see 90 Japanese films. You would have had to go to incredibly weird stores to buy them. You would have had to go to art theaters to get them. But they live in a world where the, the, the archive is sort of second nature. They just assume that it's all out there. And, you know, you can even see it in things like, you know, the top 10 movies of the year, which are all sequels or reboots. There's, a, there's absolutely no sense that in Hollywood that they're going to develop anything original. Right. And I think when you when you understand AI as a kind of response to that creatively, when you understand it, that it's like we're, we're going to t we're already in a world where it's a, of, of sequels, but this is going to be the most imaginative sequel that you could ever make. That's when you are to, uh, start to understand the creative potential of of this work. Um, you know, just to take the I can't believe it has become as popular as it has, but you know, with the arrival of text to image generation, you know, there's a lot of people claiming that it's going to exploit and replace human artists and the handiwork of human artists. Um, I, I, I simply believe as a question of fact that it's quite dubious. Uh, you know, when the San Francisco Opera Company generated an AI ad campaign, they had to employ 30 designers and engineers. Um, but I, I also think the people who worry about the replacement, um, you know, like when I was when I was young, people laid out magazines on flats. I mean, I remember seeing a guy take an image, cut it, put it on a flat and send it to a printer. Um, and and that that guy's job is gone. It's true. But there's definitely a lot of design. It's not like there's a lack of design work out there. It's not like there's no it's not like there's no uh, designers you know, necessary. And similarly, what's going to happen with this, I just firmly believe, is that you need a lot of control to be able to use these technologies. It's not going to replace labor. It's just going to be a different kind of labor. Um, but I think also more to the point, like what these traditional anxieties reveal is a kind of myopia. Like they're not, they're just underrating the consequences of artificial intelligence, you know, and, and somewhat laughably, um, you know, as if these developments were akin to the arrival of the mechanical all, uh, but for artists, like, as if the stakes were a handful of creative class jobs. Like the stakes are, what is the nature of a person inside and outside of their language? Uh, how does language mean things? Um, and what is the value of originality? Th those are the stakes. And they're a lot bigger than, you know, will someone, will someone actually have to hand draw an image of a uh, minion when they, make the, when they make the next minion movie? Right. Like it's that's that's not that's not kind of neither here nor there. So the the, the futility, the, the mistake, the mistaking of these antique fantasies and anxieties about consciousness and art and artificial intelligence. You know, I don't think they would matter so much if they weren't obscuring, you know, and I think artificial general intelligence, the creation of an artificial person, that's not an interesting question. But artificial general intelligence is the creation of a problem-solving machine capable of flexibly moving between symmetrical and asymmetrical information systems. I mean, that could transform the nature of decision-making. And the accretion of everyday changes, I think, will determine the nature of algorithmic culture that is coming much more than any of these scientific dreams. It's really the small things. Like, this is a local example. This is this is a friend of mine. This is what a friend of mine did with when he got access to ChatGPT. So I'm in Canada. Um, we all send our kids to French immersion here so that they can have a, they can we can pretend that they're going to be prime minister someday. And so a friend of mine has a son in French immersion, and his son hates reading the school's French children's books. And I don't blame him. They're usually pretty damn boring. Uh, they sure were when I was a kid. Um, so my friend went to ChatGPT. And had it write a children's French book about his son's favorite superhero, specifying the grade level and length. And ChatGPT followed instructions, and it did that. Now, that's a small thing. That's the guy on my street corner. But if if you want a book, you just ask a machine to make you one. Now, the consequences of that are are like we can talk about artificial consciousness all we like, but the consequences of that are vast. I have no idea what they are and like, and, 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 and they, but they are going to play out over decades, right? Like that, that is going, that is not something that is going to be played out overnight. That is going to be played out over a long time. Um, so let's, I, I mean, to try and think through of it, like I, as a, again, like the metaphor that I keep going back to here is the blur. 
So you have the first blur, which is a line between the human and the mechanical and language. Um, but from that blur spreads others. So in this case, the blur between the creator and the consumer, right? Like when he goes to ChatGPT and says, make me a French book, is he a creator or is he a consumer or is he, or is he literally both? Um, I, I don't know what a book is if it doesn't have a writer and a reader, if instead they're essentially the same thing because they're automatically generated at will. And I think the problem is we don't have the words yet. You know, there isn't the language to describe the mechanization of language. And sometimes this is very basic, I think. Like the word intelligence and artificial intelligence has been terribly misleading, you know, and and, and yet what other word will suit the case? I mean, I, I don't have a better idea. Um, you know, any transformer-based language model is intelligence in, intelligent in the sense that it can create coherence, which is, you know, I think a very valid definition of intelligence, right? But by any other definition of intelligence, it isn't. So, I, I mean, this this comes to very specific cases again. So, when Google announced that it had a 540 billion parameter language model Palm, uh, which is not accessible to the public, uh, you know, I I did get a tour of it with their engineers, and it was totally freaky and 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 just you know uh, you know yet another head blowing moment in artificial intelligence in the 2020s, but. You know, I was talking to the, the CEO of Google DeepMind, and in their promotional materials, they said that Palm was capable of understanding. That was the word they used, understanding. And, you know, it wasn't just hype. Like, it's not like it, it, it's it, we're in a world of massive tech hype where you, I think you have to be super suspicious of anything that you don't see. But Palm can understand what you mean, right? If you tell it to write a romantic poem or to translate a passage into Bengali, it knows what you're saying right? It knows what you're typing in. Um, at the same time, and its creators are the first to acknowledge this, uh, it doesn't understand romantic poetry or Bengali as any more than a series of patterns, right? And it does not understand understand the way that I understand romantic poetry or Bengali. It has understanding, but not understanding. And it's, I, I literally don't know what word I would prefer them to use, even though I consider it, you know, improper for them to use the word understanding. Um, in other words, the word understanding itself is a blur. Uh, you know, and I think it's important at this point to recognize like what we're dealing with with NLP, which is that I, it's sort of hard to explain unless you actually talk to the guys building it. But uh, guys and girls, certainly it's a, there, there are many, um, you know, it, it is a, a very broad group of people making this. But NLP doesn't analyze the meanings in words. It doesn't, it analyzes patterns in tokens by way of a transformer. That's the T in GPT-3. So natural language processing doesn't see the first sentence of this paragraph as NLP subject doesn't, negative, analyze, verb, the patterns in words, object with a condition. It sees NLPD and OESN and T-A-N-A-L and Y-Z-E and the T-H-E space and M-E-N-I and N-G space I space and word and S period space. So, and it sees the billions of webs between these tokens when compared to all the other tokens it can find. So the essential blur, like we see the blur between the mechanical and the human. That's what, when we use ChatGPT, that's what we recognize. Um, but the essential blur, the blur that kind of underlines it is in the structure of the transformer. And it's that it, the meaning comes through unfathomable pr processing. That this this processing is is basically abyssal. You cannot you cannot understand it. And that from that essence, I think the blur of natural language processing is only spreading, right? Because all previous art, all previous language exists to the transformer, not as a constellation of connected recognitions or patterns to be teased out along lines of context to an origin that might explain the whole. The language a model uses is the scraped internet. So more or less all the language we can find. Um, there's no difference between Yeats's Byzantium and, uh, and oh, sorry, I've lost my page here. Um, and your most recent email. Natural language processing is a disintegration followed by reintegration. And all human expression is like an enormous junkyard in fog where a mechanical claw strips everything down to the smallest bolts and reconfigures them in any approximation you can name. And a disintegrated history means a disintegrated future. You know, history as a lump of tokens cannot be reconfigured by a sudden gust of revelation 
into fresh insight or new vision. All you will be able to do by writing is to make more past. And all you will be able to write is more tokens. Um, the archives will be the source of power. Um, they will also be prisons. You know, use ChatGPT for a bit and you'll see the deal it really, it, you know, it offers. It's like the machines allows you to write whatever you like instantly, freely, with no effort, just so long as it's like everything that's come before. It is, it is much more attuned to banal forms of writing than it is to any other forms of writing. So I think the question we're about to be presented with, you know, basically on a continuous basis from now uh, is person or machine. And every encounter with language other than in the flesh will bring it with it that small consuming test. Uh, you know, for some language workers, teachers, professors, journalists, writers, the question of humanity will be urgent and essential. You know, who made these words? Under what conditions? For what purpose? Um, for others, who operate in the vast bureaucratic apparatus of boilerplate, you know, copywriters, lawyers, advertisers, political strategists, um, the question won't matter except as a matter of efficiency. How can the new technology of natural language processing accelerate the production of language that is already mostly automatic? I mean, when we talk about the automation of language, I think it's really important to remember that I got a letter yesterday that said, dear Dr. Marsh, um, you're one of our most valued customers. Like, it, for some reason, we need this language, even though it's totally pointless. Like, it, it really doesn't matter if a human writes that or a machine writes it, it's meaningless anyway. Um, so, but I think for many, it probably won't matter one way or the other where a text is human or mechanical. But the question will remain. And I think that, that you know, these anxieties that we're presented with of artificial consciousness and creative degradation, they really hide from us what we're about to face, which is you know, both quotidian and cosmic, and, you know, are going to be hovering over words wherever we find them. Who's there? And that that's going to be the, que the, the question that we're going to face, and it's going to have the most consequences for us as readers, as people in society. Um, and it's, you know, science fiction and futurists didn't prepare us for it at all. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. That was great. All right, let's open this up for uh, discussion. Uh, raise your hand and uh, I'll call on you. <coughs> it's, it's a big group. Uh, Jay. I just wanted you to return for a second to um, one of the concluding thoughts you had in your personhood section, where you said that um, if we were able to uh, identify a, a machine system as having consciousness, that the, mm -hmm. the um, corollary of that would be that we would have concluded that human beings themselves were machines and that therefore the idea of consciousness was illusory. Is that where you think it's headed or were you actually holding out for uh, something extra in the human to be found? Well, you know, I try not to have hopes and fears. You know what I mean? Like I try, I, I try to see what I see. I mean, you know, one of my rules with this stuff, because it's very hard, there's so much hype and there's so many just, just fraud uh, when you're dealing with this stuff that I kind of have it as a rule that I only believe what I see, like what I actually see. And I don't, and, but when I see it, I also believe it. Like I don't, I don't pretend it's not, it's nothing when I, when I see a computer that can write like Samuel Taylor Coleridge or whatever. I mean, my point really there was that, you know, we have these definitions of the human that we are very casual with, right? We make music, we play chess. You know, even when, you know, I, I saw um, uh, the Stanley Kubrick movie, 2001, A Space Odyssey the other day. And even in that movie with its incredible level of sophistication, it, the, the, how the supercomputer still, you know, it, you could have an interesting game of chess with it. Right. So it, even at that point, it was still the idea that with chess was a human phenomenon that no computer could arrive at. It was something about the soul. Then we learned that it wasn't that there's actually it's actually quite mechanical, quite automatable. Um, and we have this basically we have we create these kind of borders where we say this is human and mechanical is on the other side of it. And then the machines keep passing it. But we don't feel any less human. Right. Like, and we don't feel that the machines are any more human. Right. The Turing test is the ultimate example. 
right? Where this was like widely taught and discussed as the most important idea in this field for, you know, when, when, when was it written? 47, I think. So like a long time. And then we, and then we, like the moment it's passed, it seems irrelevant, right? So my point was really that we think of human as self-intentionality and it's impossible for a computer of any kind to have anything other than instructions. So if we were to think of a machine as a human, it would be that we ourselves are just a series of instructions, which of course it can sometimes feel like, right? I mean, sometimes it can feel like we are just a series of instructions. Um, but that, that really is my point that there's a very hard limit to what we think of as artificial consciousness that we just can't get to. All right, we will go with uh, Steve, David, and then Gregory. Uh, Steve Kubler. Hi, uh, thanks very much to the organizers for putting this together. And Dr. Marsh, thank you for uh, really interesting ideas. I wanted to push you a little bit on your last notion and forgive me for paraphrasing poorly that um, the AI systems that we have now and maybe in the foreseeable future are really going to just be reshuffling based on a database. Uh, and so in that sense, it's kind of a closed form set of solutions mm. of productive output relative to uh, maybe what you could say is created by a human. At the same time, we might say, well, there's this idea that we could produce Shakespeare if we gave enough monkeys enough time. We're really dealing with right. a construct with a limited number of letters and, and space. We can digitize music and you know, put it at 12-bit uh, or 16-bit and then configure those bits within space. It's still a confined solution space. So I, I think that notion of um, the, the creative tool the, the AI tool being bounded by the subset maybe glosses over what we really mean by creative impulse and the co right. coherence of art, I guess. You talked a little bit about co coherence of a, of a whole as somehow imbuing the artistic product with value. So I, I wanted to go, I wanted to push you back to that a little bit and see if you could maybe delineate a little bit further. And I apologize I think for I, the long question. I have six more like that, but it was really inspiring. And I appreciate well, write, it. Yeah, yeah. Write me an email. I'm happy to talk about it. But I mean, I think I must've expressed myself unclearly because I'm in agreement with you. I mean, to me, first of all, I wasn't really speaking about the AI systems themselves um, because I don't want to give the impression that I really, I mean, I've spoken to the inventors of Transformer and to these Palm engineers and I've, and you know, I have a PhD and like, I'm not an idiot, but I don't want to give the impression that I know what, how this stuff works. I really deal with its effects. And what I was speaking of with the recombination was really the artistic use of it, like what artists will do, rather than what the engineers and technologists are going to are going to do with it, which I which is vastly thing. And you know, I I actually totally agree with your point, like every single artistic form has a limit, has a it like has, it is only pleasurable in so far as it has restraint on it, right? The sonnet, is a very restrained form, but you can get a lot from it. Poker, there's three acts, raise, fold, call. Like you get all of poker from these very small decisions, you know, from these, this very limited range of things. So I think, yeah, AI, what it's going to provide us to is, the ability, is a new form of recombination. And one kind of, what I mean by, like what I'm responding to is people like Nick Cave who say it's not original. Right, like this is you're not dealing with originality here, and it's like, well, actually, the originality of almost every creative form is exactly these recombinations and it, exactly this plunging into the archives, whether it's you know by reading or or this way, which is actually directly <laughs> plunging into them in this with this technology with this you know unfathomable machinery. Um, so yeah, like I, I I couldn't agree with you more. Like I don't think I think this is a um, this is going to be a new genre. I think we're at the point where, like, we're at the point where we saw the train, you know, where film audiences saw a train projected on a wall and jumped out of the way. Actually, that didn't happen, but, you know, it's a cute story. So let's say, but we're at the point where people are amazed by that. Um, but we're, we, we still have to make film. We have to still figure, we have to figure out what a feature is for this. We have to figure out what, you know, how this stuff is, is going to make sense to audiences, how it's going to become its own form. It's in this very nascent state, which I think is hugely exciting. I've just been commissioned to write a novel in, in, entirely by AI and it's going very well. Like it's, I mean, it, like it, 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 you, it, it writes very well. Thanks. Uh, David. So 
Thanks very much for the talk, Stephen. I'm entirely with you in saying that it's a distraction when people say, is there a consciousness in these machines? Is there a person there? And I'm with you that we don't have a workable definition of consciousness. And it's uh, uh, therefore an empty discussion often or a, a, a tedious discussion. Yeah. But isn't it the case that science makes progress when it breaks down a initially nebulous concept into something more tangible, like heat and temperature were disentangled from each other and allowed thermodynamics to make great progress. Yeah. So perhaps the issue is the independent volition of these devices, that they're able to do things apparently in violation of their programming. And we humans, we were programmed by evolution to care about the propagation of our genes in various ways, but we humans have to some extent, uh, transcended our biological programming with all the things that we think about and care about. So my question is, how confident can you be that the next generation of these large language models won't also demonstrate some independent volition and therefore be much harder to predict and even possibly much harder to control? Because the question of the controllability of these devices, I think, should be key. If we are deploying these systems, thinking we know what they're going to do and what they won't do, and then they act apparently independently, that is something we should know about in advance so that we don't hand over the keys of the Jaguar or whatever to the these systems. So you said chat GPT is quite bland at the moment. In, a, mm. in some sense. And that's my experience too. It produces wonderfully good text, but it's not a crazily original. Some of its poems are very, very amusing. But yeah. isn't that partly because it's been designed to be a bit bland because of the RLHF, the reinforcement yeah. learning by human feedback? So some of that's been taken off on purpose. And isn't it also possible that just a new combination, because what's remarkable about these systems is they're no longer just plain large language models with transformers, but they're increasingly hooking into other systems. So somebody's going to hook them into Wolfram Alfram to do any yeah. mass problem. Somebody's going to hook them into a Google search. Somebody's going to hook them into a system to validate whatever has been hallucinated actually is true or not. So yeah. can you be confident that, well, first of all, do you agree that the question of independent volition is more sensible and more deserving of our attention than, in, than artificial consciousness. And are you confident that we're not going to stumble on that independent volition in artificial machines sooner rather than later? Well, I would say, I mean, I, this is kind of a non-answer, but the, the truth is that we don't, we don't have a Darwin or a Newton of consciousness. Like we don't, we don't have the, the person who has come in and given us the theory that explains how it works. It's certainly not Freud, right? Because it doesn't, you know, none of that is falsifiable, right? So, um, like the, the idea that someone will come along in a generation and solve it. I mean, you know, they probably didn't think that was the the problem of, you know, the richness of nature was going to be solved in the generation before Darwin. Of course, someone could do it. I just, of course, have no idea how that would be. I would say that on on the on the question of whether large language models are going to achieve volition, um, the large language models that I've seen, um, including Palm, which does pretty decent low level chain reasoning, and is you know it's weird when you explain things to it like how how many you you teach it like a child how to pick apples and it figures out math not by math but by language um and you know the other other incredible things that, with, that's happening with language that are very mysterious like why all these medical um achievements can be done through language when they couldn't be done with artificial intelligence and other modes which really points to some very profound questions about the nature of language itself and the nature of meaning um it's, it's very mysterious right like and i i don't i don't um i don't I don't shy away from that. I mean, I, I think this stuff is, I sometimes have mystical feelings about it, if I'm being honest. But the truth is asking whether this stuff, the stuff that I've seen is going to get to consciousness is like asking if a pocket calculator is going to get to consciousness. Like it's not, like it's not on the way. Like it, it's not, it's not, it's not going in that direction as far as I can tell. I mean, but you know, I mean, there are, but on the other hand, what do I know? But like what I what I see here are systems that have use functions. They're not 
and whether intentionality is even useful. I mean, I think we should remember we don't treat actual consciousness particularly decently in this world, right? Like it's not particularly something that we use, it, it, that we use with responsibility. There are 60 million slaves on this planet right now. There's no lack of consciousness if we want to use it. Um, like, like the, the, why would any, the question is also why would anyone want to build it, which I think is, is a really interesting question. But I, all, all I can say is miracles can happen. I mean, I would not have believed GPT was possible, um, but what I've seen is, is not on the way towards intentionality, in, in, in my opinion. Uh, Gregory, and then uh, Steve, and then Arthur Charlesworth. I have a couple questions. The first is simply that uh, the algorithm algorithms are locked in. My understanding with deep learning is through uh, multi-layered neural nets. They actually, and this is the pre-trained part of GPT, um, are reconfigured as new data comes in, different weights are assigned. So yep. the algorithm is updating, uh, but I wanna, so setting that aside, I want to bring up an argument that took place a generation ago between B.F. Skinner and Noam Chomsky. And um, Chomsky published, uh, and I haven't reread it in years, but a rebuttal to behaviorism in the New York Review of Books. And if I recall, um, the heart of Chomsky's argument um, and you know, generative grammar, et cetera, was that every human utterance is original. And now, of course, we can falsify that pretty quickly, but um, if that, I think there's much more to his argument, but I just want to go with that for a second. If that becomes a measure of the success of GPT, uh, or chat GPT or GPT-3 or uh, 3.5 or 4, which is on the horizon, um, then it does reach a certain level. Now, you probably are familiar with uh, GPT-0, um, which was written by a, a Princeton student, and it is an AI detective. So a lot of uh, efforts yep. right now uh, probably, uh, I think OpenAI is looking at watermarking in some way, uh, the output of uh, chat GPT. And I actually allow my students to use chat GPT. And then I ask them to run GPT zero, which has two measures, uh, which I'm still trying to get a better uh, intuitive understanding. The first is perplexity. And yeah. the the second is burstiness. And I find these terms non-intuitive. And what I haven't been able to do is craft a rubric so the students can self-assess the, the text that they are encouraged to rewrite from a prompt they start with when they write something. And we're, this is for a class on NFTs and uh, crypto technology and blockchain. Right. Um, so, and then there's the last thing I want to throw in. Um, Brian Eno gave a lecture at the museum school in Boston probably 35 years ago. And he was talking about hip hop culture and he talked about that it's cut and paste, it's collage. And then more right. recently, Ezra Klein in the New York Times interviewed Gary Marcus, a neuroscientist psychologist who introduced the term pastiche. And then uh, brought in this technical term, bullshit, meaning there is no truth value to pastiche that um, ChatGPT produces. And I think you pointed to that it's operating at a fine level of tokens and to yeah. basically it is a prediction machine of the most likely sequence to follow the current sequence. Um, Right, so, right. I think there's a lot there. So let's get let's give yeah. Stephen a, a chance. Right. To, uh, well, I mean, I would just say, you know, like one of the things that GPT three does 
well, particularly transformer-based natural language processing, artificial intelligence, is that it renders a lot of things uninteresting, right? One of them would be, I mean, this is brutal, but I think Noam Chomsky's theories of language are not particularly interesting or relevant in the in, in the light of this technology. I mean, I've heard him give lectures on on this stuff, and he's part of a reading, reading group that I'm part of too. But you know, the, the 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 Chomsky essay that you're discussing is about whether thought precedes language or not. Um, that's a that's an unanswerable question, right? Like that's a that's a fundamentally unanswerable question. So I don't, and we're actually in a place where there are a lot of answerable questions that we need to focus on immediately, right? And so, like, and and it's similarly, it's similarly with with um, Gary Mark. Like, I always find like you know he's obviously a very uh, brilliant engineer, and he deals with the symbolic aspects of artificial intelligence. Um, but like. It, what what we're dealing with in machine language, you can call it bullshit if you want, but people find it magical, right? And it, it, it's power, like film is bullshit too, but that doesn't mean that film film isn't, you know, incredibly powerful and doesn't have an incredible power to reshape the world, right? And so I, I think, you know, we're actually in a state where we have to really concentrate on what what we're what we're actually dealing with because, you know, because it's enough, like it's like there's enough to be going on here without knowing without 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 having the the answers. And you know, as for the idea that pastiche is just bullshit, I mean, you know, tell it to Picasso, like tell it to tell it to uh, you know Jay Z, like tell it tell it to like the great artists who were recombinative from from the very beginning, right? I mean, I, like I, I don't know. I, I I mean, that seems like the, the the quote I talked about, Marshall McLuhan, where he talks about an interface. That just seems to me so much more fruitful a way to understand this. It's not the rejection of the past or like the disruption in the future. It's actually like in the interaction of two technological frames that takes like a long time to process itself out, and in which values get translated uh, across periods in in really meaningful ways and in ways that are you know, humanistic and, 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 and have a lot of power and have a lot of potential to it. So, yeah, I mean, if someone says pastiche is just not art, I mean, I just have, I just have very little patience for that. Uh, before we uh, move to Steve's point, just uh, uh, one technical comment in fairness to uh, Marcus, I think his argument was that the algorithm is just not calibrated to uh, uh, take uh, the truth of statements into consideration. Oh, that's true too. So yeah. I I, yes. That, well, yeah, I mean, obviously, this stuff has hallucinations, in it, right? right? Like, I mean, it, like, it, it's not a, it's not a truth producer at all. Like, right. to, if you treat it as a truth producer, it, it, it's invalid. I mean, I, there is an Israeli company that just posted me a, that just, I mean, everyone's trying to get me to use their stuff, where they check their large language model products against um, the internet, right? And so you have sourced tech, you have sourced text, which is. Um, you know, pretty, I don't know if it works. I haven't tried it, but obviously that's what I assume that's what Bing is going to be. Right. And, uh, that, that could be totally incredible. Uh, Steve. Yeah. Hello. Um, so at the end of your talk, you mentioned that we keep blowing past what was considered the line between the human and the artificial or whatever we wish to call it the Turing right. test being the most famous example, and we don't seem to care. <laughs> and I think that's a really interesting point. And I think you're right. right. There's a way in which it's like, well, we're not really feeling very threatened about our humanity. <laughs> yeah, really. For sure. And, and I wonder whether the, the reason for that is because we're looking in the wrong place um, for the distinction between us and the machine or something like this. You know, we're, you, you talk about consciousness, people talk about volition and so on and so forth. And it just seems to me that the essential thing is um, caring or mattering, right? That Absolutely. That, and so, and that, that, and the reason for we, we overlook that feature is because it's, of course, something we share with the whole animal realm. Yeah. We share with the living realm. Yeah. And it seems to me that life, the concept of life is the great overlooked feature and that's you know a product of the intellectualism which comes from the tradition yeah. the processing tradition of thinking about ai and so on and so on and so forth and it just seems to me like we're not feeling very threatened because nothing matters to chat gps until it matters to chat gps and if that freaking happens 
then we will care a lot. Yeah, but what does uh, that even it, mean? Like, what, like how well, can a series yeah, of instructions mean, like, matter? Do you know what I mean? I mean, you're yeah, absolutely I right. I mean, like, when you deal with, we're bodies, right? Like, that's what, like, I, I mean, I think that that's something that becomes very clear to us, right? Like, and, and you're, you're absolutely right. Like, the one, what, what they, what a machine is not, what, which none of these machines are even remotely close to or going in the direction of is being fascinated by shit. Right. Like, be, like being like, be, like the, being fascinated by what is happening, like trying to figure things out in the world. None of them are remote are get going in that way. Right. So these are like, that's why, you know, I mean, I think it's more to the point, like, it's like, well, computers can't play chess. Oh, they can. Well, I guess chess is just a big thing. Same thing with like, write a pop song, right? Like, oh, music is the defining feature of human humanity. Oh, wait a minute. A computer can do it. Well, it's just a pop song. It was already formulaic as it was, right? Like th this is a process that we keep going through um, because we don't know what a human being is, right? Because we don't know what a consciousness is, and we don't we don't have anything other than really very very vague intuitions about what it is. Or you know, some people come along and make incredibly confident statements, but guess what? They turn out not to be falsifiable. And, you know, and we're supposed to treat them seriously, even though there's, they could be, or they could not be ultimately is what you get down to. And, uh, and yeah, like we are looking in the wrong places. And I think it kind of doesn't matter if you will, because you're absolutely right. Like we're in this for our care for like, we're in, like, we're in this for our caring. I mean, I do wonder, someone's going to write a Heideggerian interpretation of, uh, chat GPT because that's exactly like care, you know, the concept of care and design is exactly as the human ratio is exactly what these machines are not related. I just, to. I just want to add one thing that I think one sure. thing where philosophers have gone beyond Heidegger because Heidegger was allergic to the concept of life. Um, so it was all, you know, it was attunement and openness and so on and so right. forth. Um, that I think a lot of philosophers want to say, if you're going to, bring to bear the kind of Heideggerian apparatus, you need to connect it to the fact that we're living beings. And that is the ground of affectivity. And yeah, yeah. well, I mean, I'm not, I'm, I'm not a philosopher, but also that was just a, like a, a thrown, a casual remark. I mean, you know, to me, that's like, there's that, but there's also like Foucault's concept of biopower. There's a lot of different ways that this could be approached. Um, but uh, yeah, like I, I think there's, those are the questions that interest me. Do you know what I mean? Like those are the ones that I think are going to be very fruitful and are actually going to be extremely relevant to the technologists, right? Like th these are not questions like, you know, I know some of these engineers and they are thinking about them all the time, often with extremely limited humanities educations that, and, and, uh, and, uh, and, and I think they're, they're going to be very urgent. Excellent. Uh, Charles, or um, sorry, A. Charles is uh, Arthur. Arthur Charlesworth, are you still there? Uh, Arthur, can you unmute for your question? Or, uh, all right, Arthur has a, Arthur has a, um, question in the comments, which we could look at for a minute in a minute. Uh, uh, Stephen, if I could uh, ask you a question myself um, mm -hmm. in the meantime. Um, you know, you uh, uh, mentioned that it's uh, far from clear uh, uh, and not really interesting uh, at the end of the day, uh, whether some of the big, uh, uh, more metaphysical uh, categories of uh, consciousness and uh, uh, creativity or the death thereof come into play. Um, I guess uh, one question uh, that sort of concedes that um, is the following. You don't necessarily have to have these um, models achieve anything like those in order for their impacts to be significant, which I think is one of the things, uh, if I'm understanding you correctly, which is one of the arguments you made. So for example, absolutely uh, narrow AI, the kind of AIs that was uh, making mortgage decisions and uh, rocket mortgage yeah. 
kind of AI that was making uh, uh, teacher hiring and firing recommendations in certain districts and so on and so forth. Uh, all of these can have, you know, if you accumulate enough narrow AIs, you can have an impact on people's ability to practice judgment in and of themselves, namely, absolutely, there's just fewer areas in which they practice it, and therefore they're not as good as it, uh, as good at it anymore. Um, if it does, you know, sort of humdrum writing in a way that calculators do, um, humdrum uh, arithmetic calculators, even though they're uh, unconscious, not conscious, uh, have sort of made um, arithmetic superfluous, largely. It doesn't seem to be a very important skill uh, uh, to learn anymore. Uh, this could make writing superfluous or everyday writing or the writing of, you know, kind of boring middle of the way uh, uh, sort of content superfluous. But there, you know, conscious or not, if writing is connected to thinking at some basic level and we stop teaching it because there's no point, uh, that's a real unskilling, even though the whole thing is stupid and unconscious. So mm -hmm. I, I guess what I'm trying to sort of portray is the sort of not with a bang, but if, but with a whimper sort of uh, uh, picture. Yeah, I mean, I think to me, it's very clear, you know, on the first point about algorithmic decision making i mean somebody showed me an image for, that somebody had they'd written on the wall at ibm in the 70s or something where it said a computer cannot make a decision because a computer a computer cannot be held accountable this seems to me like one of the fundamental truths of this era like we cannot make a computer we will we cannot have computers be responsible like take responsibility at all the responsibility has always got to become to a human so that you can fire them, right? Like that's that, that that's that, that's integral to this whole process. But yeah, I mean, to me, like the re reading the Gutenberg Galaxy again, it was exactly these small things that were that he was so incredible at putting out, and which are obviously true. Like when you're in a when you move from scribal writing to print writing, um, the personality of your expression and the grace and elegance of your writing gives way to regulated. Like how well can you regulate? the type and that's why those early german types are like squares essentially right like they're they're hard for us to read because they're but they're essentially made to be extremely rigid and look rigid because that was the effect that was given and that aesthetic fundamentally an aesthetic of rigidity gave way to the scientific process where it's like well we're gonna it's not gonna be like what are you thinking like this it's going to be what can you establish within really established frameworks Right, they, and the framework becomes the, a way of thinking about it. This is really brilliant to me. I mean, I think one of the consequences we're going to see, I mean, you know, it, we, you get into the realm of like prediction and so on, which I don't think is very useful. But have, after having used GPT for a long time, I think you know, writing is not going to go away. Uh, just like we teach children arithmetic, even though we have pocket calculators, like this is not this is not something that this is a life skill that you want to have, you know. Um, you don't want to be beholden to the computers to be able to express thoughts. Um, but at the same time, one thing that I think is going to be very much valued is personal expression, right? Like what's going to be, what's going to become valued in the writing is not like what I was taught from, you know, the age of six to about 26 was how to master very specific formulae of writing. Right. And like how to write a, you know, a, a assertive sentence, a compound complex sentence, a compound sentence and so on. How to master these techniques, how to master grammar, how to master syntax, how to master paragraph structure, how to master punctuation, how to master all, you know, all of these various things, which I was very good at. Um, and I make my living doing that's going to be much less valued in the future, just like when I when, also when I was a kid. The fact that I was a bad speller meant that I was less literate. I was considered less literate than other people, right? And that was that changed, right? Like that that became that became, and also my handwriting was terrible, right? And so I was considered like bad at writing because my spelling was bad and my handwriting was lousy. Then computers came along with spell check and and you know dot matrix printers, and suddenly I, I became a writer, right? Um, similarly, I think like what's going to happen now is that. Being able to fit the formulae of writing is going to be incredibly devalued. Like it's just going to be well, anyone can do that. Like it, like you can you don't need to be able to do it. However, the ability to express intention, 
the ability to express personality the experience the, and and originality and not necessarily authenticity but the sense of authenticity the sense of direction in a writing uh, the, the sense of having a a, a, a a direct intentionality to expression um is going to be worth a lot more than the clarity of communication and i think I, I mean, that would be one guess that I would have, but I think, I, I also think like other modes, I mean, I have a friend who, you know, has dropped, teaches Italian here and he dropped all of his uh, writing requirements for oral exams. I mean, it, it's possible we could even have a return to conversational modes of education and so on. I mean, who, who knows? Excellent. Let me uh, read you a question uh, from Arthur in the chat. He says, uh, I teach low-level computer programming in Python, as well as the more advanced uh, computer science courses required by our uh, computer science major, a course that integrates concepts usually covered in separate courses. In my view, even if students may need later to collaborate with AI systems, it is essential that students use, uh, it is essential that students learn how to use their own mind to take a problem statement specifying a desired input I output behavior and create a Python program that solves that problem. Current AI like ChatGPT is a threat to that first step in the student learning because it is very tempting for students to let the AI create the program. Uh, his his uh, audio isn't working, so he asked me uh, to mm -hmm. ask his question. Sorry, what, what was the question there? Um, I guess the question is whether the temptation isn't too great for students to use the chat GPT uh, to uh, actually. Um, oh, they're like, going to use it. Yeah. I mean, they're going to, and you know, the low level coding stuff, which is um, apparently underway, right? Like, apparently that is the, the next phase of OpenAI. Again, I, I tend not to believe things that I don't see. But you know, they, it is pretty clear that they've hired thousands of coders to teach uh, ChatGPT how to code, and it might. I mean, you know, it might make low-level coding like vanish as a pedagogical tool. Of course, I'm very excited about it because it would make someone like me capable of coding in a way that I just simply could never do with my very, you know, specific brain before. But it, it will allow you know in, in, to uh, to recombine these things in a way that I could that I you know, people like me could never do before. Um, and I think that, I think it will have a huge effect on coding. All my coder friends tell me it's incredible at it, right? That, it, that, that already, it, I mean, people are saying they're off stack and so on, like they're already using it as a huge reference point. I mean, but, you know, again, I don't really know that. I do worry about the pedagogical things, but I think, you know, nobody needed to teach me in grade six how to do sentence graphs. But they did teach me that, and it was absolutely essential in my development as a writer and person and, and in my professional life, right? I mean, I, I use that stuff to this day. It, it was not necessary from a, from a purely functional point of view, but I, I, don't, I don't really think that pedagogy, pedagogy that deals in pure functionality is always going to be extremely limited. I mean, it's, it's never those things that... Uh, that 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 drive real education or lead to real careers, really. I mean, I guess that's just my opinion, but that's that's been my life experience for sure. Excellent, Steve. Uh, Stephen, I know we have to uh, let you go. I just want to say thank you. This has been absolutely uh, fascinating and really really grateful to you. Thank you. We're, real pleasure to talk to you. You have my email if anyone wants to write me. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Bye. -bye.